Hello everyone and welcome again to Neville, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics and much much more. My name is Sava and today we are continuing our discussion of market efficiency tests, that is statistical procedures that can be used to determine whether stock returns follow random walks or not. In one of the previous videos we have already discussed runs test that have, has been devised in the 1940s and that is historically the earliest and perhaps the simplest procedure to do so. But there are more sophisticated and more precise tests that have been developed later on. For example, in 1988, Law and McKinley have famously wrote a paper that is called Stock Market Prices Do Not Follow Random Walks. What allowed them to come up with such a dire conclusion? Well, they have devised a very simple but clever procedure that exploits variance scaling under the assumption of independence, that is, random walk. We all know that when k random variables are independent and identically distributed, then the variance of the sum of those k random variables would be just k times the variance of one of those variables. And this assumption underlines the procedure of variance scaling under the market efficiency assumption. When we want to scale variance, we just multiply it by the number of trading days. When we want to scale autocorrelation, we multiply the daily standard deviation by the number of trading days, and so on and so forth. We have actually already recorded a video on variance scaling under zero and positive or negative autocorrelation, so check it out if you're interested. But today we are applying this logic of variance scaling to test whether the random walk assumption is actually violated or not. If we start with our baseline assumption that future stock returns are not influenced by current or past stock returns, means that indeed the variance of returns over some k day intervals should exactly equal the variance of the daily stock return times k, where k is the length of this chosen interval. So it means that this carefully constructed statistic, the variance ratio, which is k day variance divided by k times daily variance minus 1, and what Law and McKinley have proven is that under the assumption of market efficiency or random walk, this variance ratio statistic actually follows a normal distribution with a mean of zero. We expect that on average uh, k-day variance should equal k times daily variance. That would mean that this is on average is equal to zero and uh, has variance sigma squared. That means that standard deviation would be sigma. And uh, this variance parameter can actually be estimated from the number of observations that we have and the length of the interval that we use. It means that we have everything we need to apply the variance ratio test if we just have some database, some time series of stock market returns. And uh, Let's apply the Lone McKinley variance ratio test to S&P 500 returns over a five-year period. So another question that one might ask is, what are the values of k that you can choose? What intervals should one examine? And the short and perhaps the most correct answer would be any interval you like. But most commonly in practice, we use the intervals that are powers of two. So we will investigate two-day returns, four-day returns, eight-day returns, and 16-day returns. But obviously you can investigate any intervals, intervals of any length that you want. Sometimes you will see five-day, 10-day, or 30-day intervals, and that's perfectly applicable as well. But let's just focus on our four intervals. To figure out the variance of returns over those intervals, we obviously need to calculate the respective returns. 
So for a two day holding period return, we can apply the product formula and uh, input one plus the array of two previous day returns and subtract one. Enforcing this formula, converting it into percentage, we can see that during the first two days, the cumulative holding period return is minus 1.86%. And bottom right clicking it all the way down, we can apply the same logic to every single day, calculating the return over a two day holding period in each of the instances. For four day returns, the logic is exactly the same. We can just enforce product one plus array of four returns that come up to this particular day. So we start on the fourth day, as that is the first observation where we have enough data to estimate four day holding period returns, minus one, do exactly the same, convert it into percentage and bottom right clicking it all the way down. So we can see that over the first four days, the cumulative return has been minus 1.6%. During the next four days, it has been 0.19% and so on and so forth. For eight day cumulative returns, we start at day eight, so ninth row, and we do product one plus the array of first eight daily returns minus one. Again, turn it into percentage and bottom right clicking it all the way down. And finally, for a 16 day return, we start on day 16, so row 17. And again, we do product one plus first 16 returns, quite a big array at that point, minus one percentage, bottom right clicking it all the way down. Finally, we can calculate the respective variances. To do that, we need to apply the sample variance formula, var dot s, and we can select the whole array of returns. And uh, by the sheer token of the fact that the Excel sample variance formula considers empty cells as non-existent, we don't have to go through all the pain of applying the variance formula for every single cell, for every single interval. We can just drag it across and it will disregard the empty cells, the non-existent observations automatically. Now we can already calculate the variance ratios as we have our variances for one day intervals and for all our intervals of interest. First of all, the variance ratio for a one-day interval would be trivial, it will be always equal to zero, so let's start with a two-day interval. First of all, we need to start with the k-day variance, so two-day variance in that case, in the numerator. And in the denominator, we need to multiply the number of days in the interval, so k, by the variance over a one-day period, the daily variance. And as we're going to have the daily variance in the denominator for every single interval, we need to lock the column over here. And then, as we have this ratio, we need to subtract 1 to normalize it to an expected value of 0. And we see that the variance ratio for a two-day interval is relatively close to 0. And we could have speculated about it at the very start. Well, we can see that the one-day variance is roughly twice lower than a two-day variance, so perhaps the variance ratio test would not reject the null hypothesis for the two-day interval. You could have kind of suggested it even from the very beginning. But as we drag it across, we can see that the variance ratio increases in magnitude as we go to higher and higher time intervals, and that's precisely what most of the time happens if you deal with real-world stock market data. Then let's calculate the variance of the variance ratio, which is given by this formula over here that we have already discussed in some detail. So we just need 2 times the length of the interval minus 1 times 2 times length of the interval minus 1 in another bracket, in another parenthesis. And in the denominator, we should have 3 times the length of the interval times the whole length of the sample. So in our case, it's 1,258. So enforcing that and dragging it around, we can now calculate the standard deviations of the variance ratio to calculate the respective Z stats and to apply the Z test to figure out p-values and to apply our hypothesis testing to figure out if S&P 500 does indeed follow random walks or not. So the standard deviation would just be the square root of this variance and uh, calculating it for all four intervals, we can then enforce the respective Z stats. 
Well, as our expected value of the variance ratio is zero, we just need to divide the observed variance ratio by the standard deviation of the variance ratio. And that is the Z-stat we can use for hypothesis testing. And just as we did in the past video on the runs test, we just need to subtract from one the value of the normal standard distribution with the absolute value of the Z-stat as an input and take it cumulative. Enforcing this formula and dragging it across, we can see that indeed uh, at a two-day interval, we cannot yet reject the null hypothesis as our p-value is much larger than 5% and uh, we could have told it from the ratio between the variances that it is relatively close. But from the four-day intervals onward, our p-values are already smaller than 5%, which means that the null hypothesis that the stock returns follow random walks can be rejected for S&P 500. And uh, the variance ratio, its deviation from zero, becomes more and more significant as you move from shorter intervals to longer intervals. And that's precisely what most of the time occurs on real world stock market. And that's all there is for the variance ratio test and its applications to market efficiency testing. Please leave a like under this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I would be eager to read any suggestions for further topics on business, economics, or finance you would like me to investigate in future videos. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much and stay tuned.